Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're just giving everyone a few minutes to log in here. Um, today we're talking about upskilling, reskilling, and onboarding, the six questions that you need answered. Then we want to welcome everybody for joining us. Um, there might have been a little snafu with the with the link, so some of you might be joining um, on the internal side, um, but we're just going to roll with it here. So go ahead and um, if you can share with us where you're joining from, maybe what company that you're representing today, what you're most excited to hear about, please feel free to use the chat. Again, we're just going to give everybody a few minutes here to log in, but wanted to welcome you. Today we're talking about upskilling, reskilling, and onboarding. The six questions that you need answered. So we're just going to give everybody a few minutes. If you're just joining us, please feel free to utilize the chat. Go ahead and share where you're joining us from, what company you're representing, something you're excited to hear about today. And we are going to go ahead and get started in just a minute here. So we're letting everybody log in. We will start just with a short little video to give people another few minutes to get settled and log in, but we wanna welcome you for joining us today. Today's topic is upskilling, reskilling, and onboarding. If you are just tuning in, go ahead and open up your chat. We wanna make this an engaging session. Feel free to chat in where you're joining us from, what company, and maybe something you're excited to hear about today. Deanna, do we, where do we have people joining from today? Do you know, I don't see anything in the chat just yet. I think we're gonna give them just a few more seconds to put some information in there and let us know where they're joining from. Perfect, and you are joining us from- sunny, Los Angeles. Southern California. <laughs> sunny Southern California, yes I am. And I am in rainy Northern California today. Oh, welcome the rain, bring the yeah. rain, bring on the yeah. water. We need it. How about yes. Michael, what's it? Um, what's sunny, it like to you today? Sunny and cool here on the uh, Eastern side of Canada. Nice, nice. And it looks like we have some participants from Chicago, my favorite place. Please send popcorn. I love the Gigabyte's <laughs> popcorn mix. And Houston, Texas. There's a tamale place in Houston, Texas I'm supposed to go. It's on my list. It's called Irma's, I think. It's supposed to be Ooh, delicious. Yes. Delicious. And yes, I'm all about the food, just in case anybody didn't know that already. All about the food. Oklahoma, love it. Great. So again, if you're just joining, we're, we're giving everybody a couple minutes to, to log in. I'm going to go ahead and play a short video. We do want to keep this really interactive, so keep those chats open. Again, just giving everybody a few minutes to get started. On the front lines of a global pandemic, some total customers have fed the hungry, treated the sick, and kept their cities running safely. We're proud of everything they've done and honored that they chose us to ensure compliance with safety and wellness requirements, connect remote teams through virtual learning, enable upskilling on demand, and more. Thank you to all the unsung back office heroes, whether you're in manufacturing, healthcare, financial services, hospitality, or another industry. You kept us moving when we didn't always know what tomorrow would bring. Some total has your back with the tools you need to adapt to ever-changing conditions, build resilient, agile workforces, and unleash your talent's potential. All right. So thank you for joining us today for upskilling, reskilling, and onboarding the six questions that you need answered. We have subject matter experts joining us from Bulletproof. We've got Michael DeBuyer. Michael brings over 20 years experience as lead instructional designer. And we have Deanna Peterson, our solution architect, senior solution architect from SumTotal. Uh, Deanna has also been with Skillsoft as well. So combined, Deanna brings over 16 years experience with both content and platform. Welcome, Michael and Deanna. It's great to have you here today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having I'm us. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we are going to jump right in. We're going to get started with a poll. So uh, to our participants, go ahead and open up your chat window. We are going to have a poll for our first topic. Our first topic is going to be onboarding. And our first question is, what is your time to productivity for employees in your onboarding process? 
got less than one week, one week to one month, and more than one month. I'm gonna give everybody a chance to put some answers in here. Oh, uh, they're starting to roll in. I see it happening. Um, right now we are about 75% one week to one month, which makes sense. Yep. That's about what I would probably choose. Um, we have one that is less than one week. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So also again, uh, you know, we've got questions that are going to be answered by Deanna and Michael. This is going to be very um, conversational, like a fireside chat format. We would love to hear from you as well. So please feel free to chat in any tips, tricks, best practices, anything you'd like to share, as well as questions, additional questions and the ones we're answering today. If we have time at the end. We're going to go through the chat and answer some questions and, and share some of the comments. If we don't have time, there is going to be a follow up email that you will receive with a, a white paper and we will take the opportunity to answer some of those questions there as well. OK, Deanna, do you think we're able to announce I the results? Absolutely. The winner is definitely option B with one week to one month. There were a couple of respondents that did pop in with more than one month though there at the end. So they they kind of pushed us a little bit almost like we were going to get to C, but B is definitely the winner. Okay, not surprising. Um, I think that's what we were expecting to see somewhere in the middle there, but we'd love to hear from, you know, especially those who are on the one week side, more than one month, um, you know, love to understand I think one of the questions is even just how do you define the onboarding process too? So feel free to chime in in the chat. Any comments? First question for Michael and Deanna. What are some tips to drive quicker time to productivity? We know within manufacturing a lot of the time um, and you know organizations in general, there can be some pressure here to drive quicker time to productivity. So what are some tips, Michael and Deanna? I, I'm glad to hear that the uh, poll suggested that there's people taking as long as a month to onboard new employees because, you know, making employees productive as soon as possible is important. And what prevents that usually is an organization will begin their onboarding process with three to five days of classroom training. So the the um, the employee sitting in a room and, and not being productive. Um, and I think the first thing to do is to is to set that method aside and instead consider a plan that would see employees being productive on day one. Now you think about that. What do you need to do? In it? What do you need to cover on the day uh, in order for the learner or for the, uh, the employee to hit the floor on day one? You need to get through the safety training. So maybe you plan for a short introduction to the company and then get right into the safety training on their first morning on the job. And then uh, in the afternoon, uh, position them out on the line or on the floor uh, doing some work or doing a task. And you do the same thing on day two. Begin your onboarding session in the morning and in the afternoon, have them out, you know, being productive on the line with the rest of their team. By the end of the second week, the employee has been functioning on the line for two weeks and now they've got all the requisite training. Um, I think another important thing to drive a, a quicker time to productivity is, is scaffolding. And I've sort of already mentioned it. And that's basically the idea where you start small and you build on it. So you have the new hire working on, on one task or one machine or one part of the process, and then you build on it. Day one, they're doing one part of a task. Day two, they're on the second. They've added a step to the process. Day three, they've added a third and so on. Yeah, I, th I think those are great tips. And I love um, how, you know, you mentioned getting people to do the jobs in a portion of the day right away. Um, Deanna, what are your thoughts on uh, tips for quicker time to productivity? I love those ideas and it's something that we are talking with customers about quite a bit lately. And one of the things that we have in some total that really supports that thought process, whether you are doing everything within that one week of onboarding or you're spreading it out over a few weeks or even a few months, the initiatives in some total can help support that methodology and what you want to do and the messaging that you want to put out there for your end users and your learners. So you can start them off in the system. They know exactly what's expected of them. They see the path forward again, whether it's one week, a month or six months, and then they see what's going to happen in that time frame. And then on that same conversation during that first day, as Michael was talking about from a scaffolding approach or even just that first day getting a 
out there to see, you know, what is this job that they've hired into and get them working in the job instead of just being in a classroom or on a computer all day. You can also introduce the thought of observation checklists. So it's where, you know, you're starting them. You're starting with that safety training. It's going to be most important, but then you're going to have a mentor or supervisor observe them doing that first day of work and putting into application what they've learned in that first day of onboarding. And then you can rate them and you can say, yes, they did this great, approve them, move on to the next step. Or you might have to send them back for another day of training and just say, okay, we need to work on this a little bit more. They didn't quite get the concept. So we have a lot of ways to support that within some total. Yeah, I think, and you touched on something very interesting. I mean, you brought up observation checklist. So mm-hmm. I think this leads back to just a blended approach, right? And Absolutely. That Michael talked about, I know a lot of our customers and organizations are even starting to experiment with things like AR and VR and um, how do you use different modalities to deliver different training and even, you know, simulating that work experience so that people are able to be productive a little bit mm-hmm. faster. Yeah, and all of that can be blended into your onboarding initiative. Yeah, I love that. You know, we hear a lot about companies preferring to have efficient onboarding. And what what are some of the risks associated with moving too quickly through that onboarding process? Yeah, efficiency is tricky. Um, during onboarding, an employee is probably going to have a mix of classroom training, um, videos, uh, probably going to have to read some forms, and uh, and floor training. And efficiency would say that you group each of those modalities all together. Um, and so you're getting through all the e-learning at one time and the videos at another time and so on. It's efficient, but it's not useful. Um, providing safety training outside of the context of the specific safety risks that a new hire is likely to face, it's going to be lost on new hires. So the risk is that the training in that case isn't going to be relevant when it needs to be. Um, A lopsided or ineffective onboarding process with the goal of efficiency um, could also leave some employees feeling dissatisfied and unimportant. Uh, New hires are interested in companies that invest in them and invest in their training And if they feel rushed during the onboarding process, they know they can just leave and go find another company that's going to take the time to invest in them. Those are really good points. Um, And I know we'll talk about this in a a little bit as well and build on that last point specifically. Deanna, what are some risks that you see uh, in rushing through the process? You know, top of mind as I was listening to Michael chat about it is disengagement. So, you know, you're going through all of your check boxes to make sure things are done and you can supply a report saying, hey, they were onboarded, you know, not my thing anymore, but you're risking disengaging them and they'll be like, okay, I'm just another number in a business that doesn't really care. So by having that onboarding set up and specific and talking to engagement as well as safety and having that in some total where you can see again that clear path and it's taking you through those different types of engagement whether it is just online learning um, you know, instructor-led learning, or it's connecting you with a mentor. Um, all of those pieces are going to be important to keep that engagement and to make sure that they know and understand that they are an important person and a valuable asset to your company and not just a number. Yeah, I, so true. I mean, you led us right to our next question. So perfect segue, Deanna, which is how do you design your onboarding programs for long-term retention? You know, I think I think the best way to design your onboarding for long-term retention is to plan for long-term onboarding. Uh, I'm an advocate for the idea that onboarding can go on for, for a long time with new hires gradually learning more about the business over time. And this can be done with like structured training interventions like we've been talking about, but can also occur organically as new hires ask questions of their teammates and hear their answers and that sort of thing. So what underlies a longer ongoing onboarding program is the creation of what I call a learning ecosystem, which is a wide range of opportunities that can be positioned all around a facility and woven into each employee's day. It can be as simple as instructional posters hung in break rooms or near equipment where they're relevant, or job aids and manuals located near machinery. You can plan lunch and learn sessions on problems raised in employee suggestion boxes. And of course, you can pair uh, experienced employees with new hires so they can answer questions. 
and this and this can be augmented by the micro learning opportunities and things like that on mobile devices and so on. It all contributes to this ecosystem uh, that sustains long term onboarding. I love that it's and the learning ecosystem. I think that's such a great way to describe that you mentioned um, surrounding the employee with learning and everywhere. It just makes me think of Google. Google does learning on the loo, um, which is truly <laughs> surrounding them, you know, taking every every opportunity to learn. Um, Deanna, from a from a platform perspective, I know you talked a little bit about these things um, earlier, but you, you, do you want to expand on how you might leverage a learning management system or your talent platforms to design your onboarding programs for long-term retention? Oh, 100%. So I, I promise I'm not going to keep going back to the initiatives or the onboarding, but one last thing I do want to mention about it is that with the re recent releases, what we've done is we've allowed you to, um, you know, time out when that onboarding is going to happen. So you can say it's going to be 30, 60, 90, or as Michael was saying, it could be a six month process. It could be a year where they're constantly being re-engaged through the initiative for their onboarding to come back in to learn something new, to take that next step in their path. So they're really powerful and there's a lot that you can do with them. But during that time, and one of the things that you can introduce them to is their career path. And I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well, but I'll just touch on it, where you can show them based on skills that they have in the system, competencies, even learning activities that are tied to their job, they can see how great of a fit they are for their current job, and hopefully they're a pretty good fit since they're actually in the job. Um, but then they can also see other jobs within the organization and how they fit into those jobs and where they could possibly move up, move laterally, or move into a completely different group. So those are going to be very powerful. But one last thing I have to mention, and um, there was a mention of learning in the loo, which cracks me up, and posters on machines or posters within the um, within the break rooms, etc. One thing that you may not know that you can do within your sum total system is you can get QR codes for those learning activities. And what you can do is you can put those QR codes on those posters, because everybody has some sort of mobile device with them usually, scan the QR code and it can take them to a curriculum that's going to train them on that machine. It can take them to a shared link that goes to a library topic that you're excited about that has new content about this new offering that you've made available to everybody. So really engaging them and not only showing them the visual, but giving them the path directly on that visual in order to get to that training. Yeah, I think I think that's so key. One thing you know we didn't talk about, but is a, a lot of our customers are experiencing is the multi-generational workforce and you know a lot of the research says that millennials and Gen Zers really want to feel engaged in the culture of a company um, and they want to be part of that whole purpose. So I think another tactic is making sure that your onboarding programs really um, also include like immersing them in the culture and the mission as well. And, and that's a great way to get them into that culture is through that onboarding because everybody is going to see the same message and they're going to be taken through that same path, depending on their jobs and where they land. But it's a great way to get everybody introduced the same way. Yeah, I agree. So that takes us to our next topic, which is upskilling. And we've got another poll. So get get your chat ready. Um, our poll question number two is how does your organization identify people to upskill? Do you A, upskill everyone, B, focus on high performers, C, focus on low performers, or D, only people who ask for it? Give everybody a little bit They're of time to get to some answers in. in. They're, They're pouring still, in. Yes, they are pouring <laughs> in at a trickle. <laughs> but they are definitely starting to come in. And it's really a cool mix all the way across, whether it is upskilling everybody about 16%. It's a it's a tie right now, a three-way tie. Oh my goodness, this is exciting. Between A, B, and D. So and D okay. is starting to pull out for the win. I yeah. think D D comes through at the end with <laughs> the win. OK, you know, I mean, to me, that makes sense. And we 
even B and D, because a lot of the time the people who are asking for it are actually going to be your high performers. And I know uh, another thing we hear from our customers is their stretch for resources or trying to make the case for upskilling people. Everybody knows that it's important, but a lot of the time trying to get funding to to do it, you have to build an ROI and, and show the u- specific use case for it. So. Um, it's not surprising to me that it would be a select part of the population. Which brings us to our panel question, which is how do you ensure upskilling provides the employee with what they need to advance in the role? So there are really two things I think of when it comes to upskilling, and I group them as formal and informal. So I'll start with the informal. I'm, I'm an advocate for uh, a company developing a culture of learning. So the culture's employees are engaged in learning and they want to learn more about their role and the company as a whole, and they're eager for learning opportunities. And to them, I just say, make those opportunities available. Lunch and learns, posters, scannable QR codes on machines that lead to training and all the rest of it. And these eager learning employees then are going to be good candidates for upskilling and that kind of aligns to the poll. Uh, In terms of the formal, let's acknowledge that there's levels employees can advance and those levels and processes to advance should be clear to all. We know from numerous studies that employees that understand the process of advancement are going to be more satisfied with their work. So distinguishing the levels and the different skills required at each should be accomplished through competency mapping and career pathing. Uh, Dan, you mentioned both of those earlier. Mm -hmm. But here's where the formal and the informal come together. If a company has a culture of learning, some employees, those high performers and or, or those who ask for upskilling opportunities uh, from the prior question are already ready to advance because they've taken the time to invest in the training around them. So for these employees, I, I'd suggest having a test out assessment ready that corresponds to the competency map so that they can prove uh, that they're ready to advance when they're ready to advance. Yeah, I think that's great. The competency mapping and skills, I, that I think it, that's one of the hardest parts, right? And mm-hmm. the career pathing, it, and that's where a lot of the work has to be done um, to actually map those competencies. But it's so important to provide clear visibility into how somebody can can advance and and what investing in their own development, how that will benefit them within that organization and to show them that there is a path for for advancement. Deanna, you know, what are your thoughts from um, the the platform side learning talent? Um, I think you use it to your advantage. Use as much of it as possible to get to this place where you can say that you have that very clear career path. And yes, it does take some work. You have to know what those skills are, what those competencies are, um, what the job description is, what the role is, and it needs to live within your sum total existence. So, so getting to that place is going to take you some work, but I think the payoff is going to be incredibly high. So you would be able to, on that first day, as we were talking about from onboarding, show somebody their career path, where they stand today, and show them all of those opportunities that are then out there that they match for just by simply including their information from their resume that they may have put into some total or um, through their initial 30, 60, 90 day performance management snapshot where you're rating them as a manager on how they're doing in those specific areas and how they're doing within that role or even with trainings that they have completed. All of that can come together and give you a very clear idea of where you're going. But then even more so as a learner, as a user, when I'm in there, it's great for me to see, oh, that's that's awesome. I can go into this new role, but I don't know when there's ever posting about it. I don't ever hear about it because I am doing my work. If you have talent acquisition turned on, it will show me or I can get job alerts that are going to show me when that opening is available. And then I could go in and I could simply submit my resume online. So all of it ties together. It's all there. It's just a matter of deciding, okay, this is how we're going to set that path out for our users. Yeah, yeah, but I think like you said, it's very, very powerful. It is. And, you know, if you don't have the time to do it initially to put all those pieces in place, you know, publish a PDF with the job description and link that to the job so that people can see at least what it requires. So there's ways around it. (laughs) 
Um, you know, another challenge when we look at upskilling and specifically in industries like manufacturing, there's a large dustless workforce. There's a global population. It's multi-generational. Um, what are some considerations when upskilling um, this type of workforce, you know, multi-generational global, and there may even be some technology gaps? Well, let me let me take the global question first. Um, I think the global audience is going to benefit from hearing a consistent message as all the other locations in a format that's equally accessible, which is essentially an argument in favor of e-learning. Um, when it comes to uh, a global audience, though, uh, I think it's important that you consider localization. Um, a localization is essentially a process like translation, but it takes into account um, cultural and uh, legal and regulatory differences uh, that, that would apply to your different regions. So you provide a, a, a consistent message, but then you localize it to your different uh, locations. Um, one thing I would say that as far as your global audience is concerned, anytime you're making training for them, um, be sure to involve stakeholders from the various locations in the review and approval process for all training pieces. Um, when it comes to your multi-generational workforce, the, the, the question does usually trip up over technology. And the stereotype is that the older generation prefers to sit in the lunchroom and watch a video or listen to an instructor. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's untrue and I think it's outdated. Most of the older generation comes to work with a smartphone just like everyone else, uh, and they have equal access to videos and e-learning and all kinds of different modalities on their phone. But it goes to the point I was making earlier about having multiple modalities available. Uh, in a multimodal environment, in a, in a learning culture, uh, the employees, young or old, all have access to different types of learning opportunities, and then they can go to those, uh, whatever, whichever they think is going to be the best suit for them and, and learn the way that's best for them. Yeah, I think those, those are great tips. Um, Deanna, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, some total within the platform, we support all of that, whether it's multilingual, multimodal, all of those can be supported from a learning aspect. But one of the other things that I like to point out to customers is when they are looking at that multi-generational and you might have those that are going to be retiring out soon, but they really are your brain trust. You need to get that information. You need to pull it out. So encouraging them to make those learners, um, you know, content creators where they're uploading videos or they're submitting content to be uploaded that is tips and tricks that they've learned along the way and things that they've done that might not be written down in a manual anywhere, but encouraging them to contribute to the content in any way possible, I think is going to be very powerful too. I, I think, you know, social is so important. And one Absolutely. of the things that we hear specifically around our manufacturing customers is not just the multi-generational, we know that a large population is retiring and you want to capture that knowledge, but, um, even just because d different plants may be very siloed mm -hmm. and it's hard um, to spread that knowledge across the organization. So how do you disseminate things that are happening in Germany that could be working really well in North America? So I love I love that aspect of right. the tool. We were coming to an end very quickly here. So the 30 minutes went by fast. Our, our final topic's reskilling. This is an easy poll though. So I think the answers really should be pouring in on this one. Would you agree that reskilling employees is critical to business success? Um, we'll give everybody a minute here, but but I think we know what the answer might yes. be. I think our love of talking is coming to, to a, a head here with our time. <laughs> We do love to chat. Um, yes, so I, I don't have any no's yet, so that's a good thing. All right, we're gonna we're gonna assume it's a yes because yes. we we do want we do want to cover our last and final question. What are the yes. core components of a successful reskilling program? Okay, so as the poll proves, reskilling is important. So what do you need to do? You need to be ready. And the components of a successful reskilling program are going to draw from the various modalities we've already discussed in that in that training ecosystem. The one thing I will say in addition to that, um, while you're making those reskilling opportunities available, consider providing soft skills training as well. It's an important feature, especially for your younger, your younger audience, so they're not just learning how to do a job better, but they're developing the skills that increase their potential at work and outside of work. You think of management training skills, leadership skills, and that kind of thing, which could have a really positive impact on your workforce. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Deanna, um, I know we didn't have a lot about the platform site, but you were bringing some 
some experience right yes. from your skill soft days about the core components here of a successful reskilling program. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when you're talking about soft skills, um, you know, the skill soft content, third party content, any content that you're bringing into the system is really going to help support that. And I always would think it's funny when I worked on the skill soft side and we would do our quarterly business reviews, we'd go over the top courses. And before I would review them with the team, I would ask them what they thought were their top courses and they'd give me all their ideas. And it was mostly internal or very lofty ideas. And it turns out the top courses were always how do I work with my peers? How do I deal with, deal with the difficult? boss and you know things that were more about how to navigate their life in this work environment and they were always surprised by that because it wasn't conversations they were having but your learners feel comfortable finding that information and taking that online and being able to digest it and then hopefully increase their knowledge or help them in those conversations so you know bring those into your platform you'll have your technical information you'll have your technical content which is always going to be relevant and very specific to you but always always bring in those soft skills because that is what everybody is looking for. Yeah, and I think that's what allows them to be flexible, right? When, and yes. when you're creating agile organizations, you want that growth mindset. People need to be um, able to, to change as the business changes and, and be able to adapt those skills. Because like you said, the technical stuff, it's always going to be changing. The product always. is going to be changing. Right. So it's really, you know, about building those foundational skills. And those skills that you take with you to all your jobs. Exactly. Yeah. So what's next? I'm this 30 minutes blew by. I think we could talk about this for hours. Um, so the next step, we would like to offer everybody on this webinar a complimentary 30 minute consultation. So if you there should be a link that we're going to drop in the chat here. You can use email. If you're a some total customer, you can reach out to your um, customer sales director or um and, and you know work on scheduling this but we would we'd love to talk more about this topic again we are offering a, a complimentary 30-minute consultation with holly sherrod from bulletproof we are also going to send out a recap email with some helpful tips that we've covered today and if there were any questions in the chat we will go over those uh, but really want to thank everybody for, for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing the discussion with each one of you.